Welcome to Taiwan Youth Farm. Could you briefly introduce yourself to our audience? Okay, sure. So I'm Irene, and I'm currently 26 years old. I'm revealing my age here, <laughs> and um, I have been doing marketing and PR for most of my career, professional life. And prior to this, I went to school in the States, in Massachusetts, for college. I went to Wills League um, in Massachusetts which I already said, <laughs> and um, prior to that I was at TAS, um, Taipei American School. So I basically grew up here, spent most of my life in Taiwan before moving out to college. And in terms of who I think I am, like if I were to use some words to describe myself, it will probably be a musician, mm -hmm. an artist, a poet maybe. Um, so I think of myself more as an artistic kind of person. Yeah. Okay. So um, most of our audience are um, like local Taiwanese students mm -hmm. who doesn't know much about like the American education system. Mm -hmm. So could you briefly talk about how like um, TAS, um, how they organize their classes mm -hmm. and how you can choose your courses? Okay. So um, Taipei American School basically followed the American education system. So it's quite liberating in the sense that we can actually choose what classes we want to take in middle, starting from middle school I remember, okay. middle and high school. So we can basically choose elective courses, whatever courses that interest us. Of course there are some core classes that you have to take, for example like English, math, science, those are like the mandatory ones. But other than those, we can explore, for example, journalism. You can even take like woodshop classes where they teach you how to chop woods. So in general, I think the education at Taipei American School is quite well-rounded. Um, you basically can explore your interests. And that's good in a way because that means before you move on to college, you already have more of an idea of what you like, what you don't like, what you want to pursue further in terms of um, education and career. Okay, cool. Yeah. And um, I think for a lot of people, we have like an assumption that TAS students have a lot of leisure time oh. and they do a lot of like extracurricular work. So oh, can okay. you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. I don't think it's because we have more leisure time, <laughs> but I think it's the fact that there are a lot of extracurricular um, activities available. Yeah. So most of us after school, we can you know indulge in sports, or you can go take like music classes. There's like the music route, which I did. So I was involved with um, chamber music ensemble, okay. and I also did some you know volunteer work with uh, Ciji and okay. also World Vision um, 世界展望会 and we also have Amnesty International, which I believe is uh, 人权组织 oh. something like that. So at TAS. As young as middle uh, middle school, they actually actively encourage you to you know explore outside of your curriculum as well. Like in you know during the after school hours, um, it's not just like sidu um, shu, you know, prepping for like college, which I believe a lot of the local schools here do. For us, it's all about offering you a very well-rounded ed education and enabling you to you know, figure out who you are, what you like, what you want to do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so after you graduated from TAS, yeah. you went to Wellesley yeah. College, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And as uh, many of us um, Taiwanese students, mm -hmm. we don't really know what liberal arts education okay. is, so could you please like, uh, sure, introduce sure. what the curriculum mm -hmm. is like? Okay, so basically liberal arts college, you can think of it as more of a boutique scope of mm -hmm. college in the sense that typically it doesn't, um, in a liberal arts college, you don't get more than 20 or 30 people per class. Okay. So we have a very, very small class size as opposed to a lot of the major universities, which you, you, know, you may have like 150 or more per class. And university, I would say, is more research driven. Most of the professors you have at university, they're actually, um, they, they are actually invested in you know pursuing their own research. So sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes they don't really focus too much on teaching. Like teaching could be of secondary importance to them. Whereas at a liberal arts college, the professors generally care about you, about um, you know your, your, your academic pursuits and you as a person. So they definitely invest more time and energy on you. And also because of the small class size, what it means is that we get like 
you know, one to four, like teacher to student ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you are the kind of student who really like to have, you know, interaction with a teacher, or more of an opportunity to have discussions in class, you know, to speak up, to voice their opinions, I think liberal arts is perfect for you. Because we really do value, you know, classroom discussion, seminar, whereas at a university it is mostly like um, lecture style. You know, yeah. they tend to sit um, in like an auditorium with hundreds of people, with a professor up front like talking and people taking notes, or most of the time like dozing off, or, like sleeping, <laughs> whatnot. So it really depends on what kind of an educational experience you want. And also another thing about liberal arts is that we really aim for a well-rounded education. We don't require the students to pick their major in mm -hmm. the first year. Um, and we really encourage them to explore like the arts, the humanities, the social science, the human, um, I already said humanities. <laughs> so we really explore, uh, encourage the students to focus not on one field, but on multiple fields, because we want them to have more of a cohesive understanding of you know the world. So. Yeah, I would say how uh, that's how um, a liberal arts school is different. Why did you choose to go to a liberal arts college mm -hmm. like instead of like a research-based university? Okay, um, I guess the reason is because I have always been more interested in like the humanities. So some of my uh, some of my friends who are you know science major, I, I think going to a big university would help because they say because they have a lot of like funding on research. Yeah and things like that and I, I would say their resources on labs would probably be a lot more sufficient than like a small scale um, liberal arts school but for me I know from the very start that I wanted to do liberal arts because um, I'm interested in the humanities so my major is actually in economics yeah so in the liberal arts you get to tackle issues more from like the academic side which I love yeah so that's why I picked liberal arts yeah. So did you know like you wanted to major in economics when you applied mm -hmm. for college or did you decide later on? Um, I think I actually was aiming for international relations, mm -hmm. IR, um, at the very beginning. And because IR required too many credits, <laughs> and econ happens to be one um, one major focus on the IR. There's like, you can focus okay. on uh, political science for example. Mm -hmm econ or um, I think it was social science or something so I decided oh why don't I just focus on econ since I already have taken some classes um, on the econ so that's how I picked this major oh actually I could share a little bit about why Wellesley in particular because Wellesley is also a, a, a women's college um, um, yeah we don't have any male students in our school so I think back then uh, when I selected my schools, I was aiming for a school that would provide me a very different educational experience that I cannot find myself in like mm -hmm. anywhere else. So Wellesley happens to you know fulfill a lot of the check boxes because it's an all women's college. You don't get that many women's college around. So I know that kind of experience is going to stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, I mean, where else can I find myself? You know, immersed in an environment that's just purely women, right? And another thing is Wellesley, um, at Wellesley everyone is really driven. All the women I've met there are very ambitious and um, I think I find them really inspirational. They are constantly, you know, trying to push their limits. Um, they always have these goals in mind that they want to achieve and accomplish. And our school motto is actually um, to, to, it's in Latin, it basically says, um, not to be ministered upon, but to okay. but to like take action. So what that means is that we're not here to follow orders. We're here to make a difference in the world. Yeah, and Wellesley also has a lot of um, well-known alumni. For example, Hillary Clinton, who almost okay. won, almost <laughs> won. Um, I mean, she did win the popular vote, but um, yeah, like Hillary or Madeleine Albright. So two of the past. Um, you know, U.S. Secretary of State have been from Wellesley, and there is also Johnson Mailing. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason why I picked the school in particular, because our alumni network is quite solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So um, can you uh, going back to our discussion yeah. about um, like majors and the mm -hmm. curriculum? 
How, what is like the percentage of like major focus courses yeah. and like the other broad general requirement courses yeah. that you have to take? Okay, so like I already briefly mentioned, uh, liberal arts is quite different that I don't have to focus on one subject area. So what that means is we don't have that many required credits. So I would say only about one third of the courses I took are uh, must take courses okay. Yeah, to fulfill my major requirements. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I got to explore a lot of um, areas that were really far-fetched, like that were very out of the blue, you could even say. For example, I took three classes on Russian literature, oh. and my parents were kind of, they, they were a little shocked. No, it's more like they were amused by the fact that, you know, this is completely um, not relevant to what I'm doing in terms of my major. but. Liberal arts is all about exploring again. So I took three classes on Russian literature. I did some, you know, philosophy classes. Okay. Yeah. So the percentage is about only, yeah, it's, it's like a one one third allocation of my classes that was on the uh, my major. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how would you say like your free elective classes such uh -huh. as like the Russian literature class, how has it influenced you in terms uh -huh. of like uh, professional life or just academic life? Sure. Um, I won't say they have that much impact on my <laughs> professional life because for those courses it's not as much about um, acquiring certain skills mm -hmm. that you could readily apply to the work, um, you know, in, in the work setting. But I think, you know, life isn't just about work. A lot of the times, um, when through these explorations, you also get to explore some of your hobbies, some of your interests. And for me, I've always loved reading. So I think Russian literature really satisfied that part of my need. I love reading literature, you know, entering another world, you know, that's uh, taking me kind of away from the here and now but into this another era or something but in a way i would say these courses they help me in terms of critical thinking because mm -hmm. even in literature classes you have to be able to think critically and to be able to connect the dots and to find some underlying themes that kind of propel the whole story forward yeah so it isn't just you know reading literature but not exercising your mind. You actually have to stay engaged. You have to use critically think uh, critical thinking as well. And another thing about how my classes have you know shaped who I am, which I, I think is your next question, is the fact that at a liberal arts education, you really need to learn how to communicate whether it's through verbal communication or written communication. Um, I don't think most at most universities you get much training in that because you know the class size is way too big. So it's mostly like research focused. But um, but at Wellesley, you know, you have to be able to be articulate. Um, you have to be able to find your stance, you know, to be able to negotiate and things like that. Um, so I found all these very valuable later on in the professional setting. Mm -hmm. cool. And um, at the beginning, you yeah. mentioned that you're a poet, a musician, and an artist. Did you get to explore those um, fields yeah. in how was Yeah, yeah. Um, for example, I remember I was very inspired by this Russian literature book <laughs> at one time. I actually wrote several poems like, inspired mm -hmm. by the story. And I actually even composed a music on piano wow. that was kind of based off you know a book that I read in class and and yeah I have taken a lot of uh, music classes music is actually my minor oh, yeah so okay. I really got to you know explore on my hobby in that sense and I was actually involved in um, the MIT Symphony Orchestra wow. oh that's another thing about Wellesley um, we can actually cross register mm -hmm. at MIT so the symphony orchestra is one of the many um, activities that I have taken through this cross registration program. But I also did mm -hmm. some courses at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Mm -hmm. So I would say those are more for like preparing me professionally. Okay. But music and arts and literature, those are just you know kind of shaping me as who I am outside of the professional box. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
And um, so about the cross-register um, yeah. program with MIT, was yeah. that something you considered from the start or was it uh, like something that you found out later on and decided to mm -hmm. apply for? Um, that was actually one of the many reasons that I picked Wellesley. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, to be honest, I don't think my SAT or GPA was good enough to be able to to allow me to enter MIT directly. <laughs> but through this registration program, I got to take many classes, like I said. Um, for example, I did marketing management, I did consumer behavior, I did um, pricing, I did a lot of you know business-related courses. And those okay. courses are actually out of um, outside of the liberal arts uh, okay. realm. Yeah, so I think you get the best of both worlds at Wellesley because you get a very solid you know, liberal arts program with the yeah. school itself, but through this cross position program, you got to take a lot of more practical courses and also get to you know experience kind of like the typical university ecosystem there. So I get like the best of both. Cool. Yeah. So was it like you took like uh, so within a semester you have some courses from Wellesley yeah. and then some courses from MIT? Uh, uh, was it's, it like it's usually um, I think you have to wait till um, the second semester of your freshman okay. year to start taking classes at MIT, and for most of my college years I think it was like half half. I, okay. I was it was split half half between Wellesley and MIT. But my last year was actually quite crazy. I only had like one Wellesley course yeah. and all the rest was in YT. And I did it that way intentionally because I wanted to prepare myself for the professional world. So okay. that was the, the semester where I took a bunch of you know, management related business courses at um, Sloan School of Management. Okay, cool. Yeah. And did you get to do any internships during your college years? Yeah. Um, I did internships every single summer wow. um, of my college year. So I did, uh, I did, what did I do? Um, oh, Warner Music, because I was okay. quite interested in music. So mm -hmm. I did that for one summer. And I also did, uh, oh, PricewaterhouseCooper, accounting, accounting, but I didn't end up coming into this field. And I also did Ogilvy. Oh, yeah. Okay. So my first job, I actually began as an intern back when I was in college, awesome. yeah. And how would you say these internships has helped you? Um, it, the internships have helped me figure out that I'm not a content material, so I didn't go that route. And it has helped me clear the path and to understand that PR and marketing mm -hmm. are something that I'm more interested in, yeah. And um, could you briefly introduce like mm -hmm. what uh, P public relation is about? Like what do you mm -hmm. do and like what kind of people you meet, what kind of con uh, customers you have? Okay, so this is, I can start with a big picture. So sure. basically in the advertising and marketing service industries, um, you are more on the agency side. So what that means is you provide a professional service to you know, companies across different um, verticals, like different okay. industries. So at Ogilvy, um, the Ogilvy group itself actually has like Ogilvy advertising and there's Ogilvy public relations and there's another, um, you know, focus on digital and there are tons of different companies on our Ogilvy. But PR especially is more about um, communication with the press. Mm -hmm. So okay. for public relations, you don't directly communicate to the audience, to the mm -hmm. end consumer, you do it through press. And how you do it is you, you, you know, you have press events, like, okay. yeah. So through like press release, press events, you get to help a brand shape its image. Okay. And that will in turn change how the public will perceive the brand. Mm -hmm. So that's what PR does in a nutshell. But besides, you know, press events, we also have like media monitoring, we have to help them monitor their, um, their news on a daily basis to see whether the perception has plunged, has um, increased. And that's Oh, we also do um, crisis management in okay. PR. That's another field, and we also do like corporate social responsibility for big corporations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are um, what we do in the PR setting, and um, I can also share a bit more about what I do now because um, I'm actually working on a branding agency now. So branding is at an even higher level because you can think of PR as more of a event activation okay. um, level. But with branding, you have to start from the very beginning on a strategic level. 
how you can position a company. Um, what's the company's name even? Like we sometimes talk about it, naming for mm -hmm. some up and coming companies and startups. So, you know, we start at the very top level, naming, slogan, logo design, their mission and vision, and their, you know, corporate messaging house. Um, and then we branch out to like the visual identity system, you know, how you want the brand to be cons uh, consistent across many different touch points, retail, digital, or, you know, just all the different touch points out there. So that's on an even higher level, that's branding. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. okay. And how would you like describe uh, the people you've met in like the PR and branding mm -hmm. uh, industry? Like, are they creative? Are they yeah. artistic? Uh, I think they are creative. Um, you get strategic and uh, you get strategy and creativity at the same time. Um, in those two places, and I would say the people there are more outgoing. They're you know they're fun because mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to know how to have fun if you want to work in this industry in a sense. Okay. Um, so I would say they're quite dynamic. They tend to have many different interests outside of their professional career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and um, from your um, resume, we kind of got to know that you work for like smaller companies and also like at big corporations. Could you talk about the mm -hmm. difference at um, working at both uh, companies? Okay, sure. Um, so I can share a little about where I work right now. Um, it's a small boutique branding agency and it's actually founded by um, the founder of Interbrand. So it was founded oh, okay. in New York City. So our legacy is actually quite strong, but the company itself is, is more on the younger side. and. Um, how a small boutique firm is different is that um, it's more dynamic. Okay. What that means is, um, you, you know, you have to be constantly um, ready for, um, I should say surprises, but, it's, but you have to be able to be more flexible. Okay. And I think that's a very good environment to throw yourself in because, you know, life is all about change, right? So in this kind of small boutique firm, you get to know how to adapt to the different to different pace and how to you know shift your mentality mindset your working model even um, in a short time frame okay. so I think the biggest difference between like a small company and big company is that big company is more structured okay. uh, it's more rigid of course there's like pros and cons like pros could be oh it's um, less chaotic you know <laughs> everything is more structured with SLP with processes and all that but that lacks the flexibility, and sometimes innovation can only come out of um, flexibility. So in a smaller company, you get to be more flexible, and you get to create more sparks. So you just mentioned um, you work for a PR company and then also like a branding firm, but you also work at an um, in-house marketing firm. Could you talk about the difference? Yeah. Um, so um, I can rephrase it a little bit. Um, so typically, when you, when a person is interested in marketing, for example, you can pick whether you want to go into agency, which is you know what I have done before with Ogilvy or the current company that I'm at. Um, and at the agency side, it's more about offering your services to you know a lot of different companies and in different industries. So agency is more about being exposed to many different um, industries at a young age which is good because it allows you to know where you want to move on to eventually. Like most people don't stay in the agency forever because agency life is actually very unhealthy. Okay. So at that time I figured I wanted to do consumer packaged goods. So I move on to cosmetics, which is a little different, but um, yeah, it's a little different, but it's also about um, selling products um, to consumers. So when I went there, my position was no longer, you know, me serving different clients. Me in the office would have to fulfill the um, like marketing within that office umbrella. And there are some pros and cons. Um, I think the the pros is that it's more focused. You get to really know about the company because you work for that brand, mm -hmm. right? Whereas at a PR, it's more like you do a little bit of all. Okay. But sometimes you're, you 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 may not really know to detail um, about the corporation mm -hmm. in terms of its 
organizational structure, things like that. But when you're in the corporate itself, you get to see, oh, like how different departments come together. Okay. And I found that very exciting. Like, oh, like sales, marketing, sometimes they have like clashes in terms of their um, their agendas. They have different agendas and you know, you have PR, you have, you know, you just have all these different stakeholders. So in the corporate world, I got to learn like how to work my way um, through all these different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, in a corporate setting, you also have to deal with politics, right? Because agency side, everyone's basically serving clients. There are no internal politics, but in a corporate world, you need to be able to know, you know, how to work your way um, mm -hmm. with all these different stakeholders. So I would say that's um, the main difference between like working in the agency versus in-house when it comes to marketing or PR. Okay. Yeah. And um, how about like from going from like in-house marketing to like a branding solely like a yeah. branding firm? Yeah. Uh, I would say that's a, an interesting move because it's moving basically back to the agency lifestyle again. Um, and I'm actually still adjusting. I actually just started this, this job um, half a year ago. Okay. Yeah, and it's really exciting. It's really fast paced, and I, I would say you get to use more um, strategic thinking um, yeah. at the agency side, at the branding side, especially because a lot of the times it's hard to do actual marketing job in Taiwan, especially mm -hmm. because a lot of the times if you're working at a multinational company the strategies are basically all set by um, headquarters in the okay. US, in Europe, whatever. So in Taiwan, it's quite often um, executional. Okay. Yeah, like you receive all these from abroad, you have to be able to deliver them flawlessly mm -hmm. through execution. So you don't touch too much on the higher level strategic thinking side, but at an agency side, you get to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's another quite interesting shift can you um, briefly talk about like what are some requirements and criteria for going into PR and uh, marketing? Um, I think the criteria is very simple. First, you have to have passion for what you do. Because okay. in the agency, most often you will have to work overtime. Um, okay. till, for example, 9, 10 in the evening. Wow. Those are considered quite standard. Okay. Um, I've actually worked till midnight. Um, oh quite often. <laughs> I would say, I, I, I'm not suggesting all of you to work that late, but in agency life, um, it's the hours are pretty long, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's considered as standard. So in terms of criteria and requirement, you, you definitely have to have passion for what, mm -hmm. what, for what you do. You have to believe in you know, the work you do. And I think that passion will really get you going. Okay. No matter you know how exhausting you may be at the end of the day, as long as you have that, it'll keep you going. So I would say you don't need too many hard skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think just by having passion will be enough to keep you moving forward. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, people who enter PR and marketing, they came from all walks of life. Some people have majored in econ in college. Some people have majored in. I don't know, like journalism, major in many different fields. You don't need to come from a certain major in order to be successful in this area. Mm -hmm. um, unlike some other industries that may be more um, focused, for example, accounting, you have to have you know accounting background. Or if you want to go into banking, mm -hmm. um, they'll want to see if you you know have a finance degree or something. But PR marketing, um, they welcome anyone from different walks of life, and. I think you have to love, you have to love communication okay. to survive in this area. So besides passion, which I already mentioned, you need to like talking to people, mm -hmm. um, you know, starting uh, striking conversations and things like that, uh, because PR marketing are very people facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to like that if you want to do um, come into this area. Okay. Yeah. And also, if you like to be in a very fast-paced environment, then I think this is the place to be. Yeah, because sometimes in a corporate setting, it could move a lot slower. Like your day-to-day -day life sometimes look pretty much the same, but in the okay. PR marketing world, you know, every day is different. Okay. So I think it's quite exciting for people who like changes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, this is kind of like, it's like a 
question out of curiosity, what are some ways that you cope with um, the pressure and like, the fast-paced uh, mm -hmm. lifestyle and all the changes? Um, what are some of the ways? I think passion, again. Um, in the end, I think it's all about passion no matter what you do. Um, no matter what work you enter. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think that's like the most fundamental in a way. Yeah, as long as you have that, everything will work out perfectly in the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's about all the questions I have. And um, I have a last question that I like to ask all of our um, interviewees yeah. at the end of our interviews. It's um, if you could give your younger self a piece of advice or mm -hmm. just a message, what would you tell her? Um, to be honest, I would tell her to him or her to relax. Okay. Um, I think it's great to figure out what you want to do at a young age, but I don't think anyone should feel pressure that they have to figure out everything in their early 20s, including, mm -hmm. you know, major, what they want to do for work, um, you know, that kind of career planning or all that. It doesn't have to be done in the early 20s. I mean, a lot of my friends, older friends in their 30s and 40s, are actually still having career shifts, for example. Okay. So I think my biggest um, comment would be to relax. Um, just to take a deep breath and everything's going to be okay because, um, you know, I think everyone actually has the capacity to fulfill their potential. Mm -hmm. No matter, you know, who you are, what stage of your life you're in. So my biggest comment and encouragement would just be to relax. And um, I wish all of you good luck, um, you know, with college application or things that come after that. Okay, thank you. Okay.